Hello? Class has started. We are looking at phase transitions, systems, may exist in several phases Bate <coughs> Ban Systems may exist in several phases and may go from one phase to the other Spontaneously. पीछे कहां देख रहे हैं आप प्लीज बातें बंद सो सिस्टम्स में एग्जिस्ट इन सेवरल फेजेस एंड में चेंज द फेजेस में गो फ्रॉम वन फेज टू अनदर spontaneously and that is what we mean by phase transitions and when this happens spontaneously it is reasonable to think that the initial phase somehow becomes unstable and the other phase becomes more stable. So a transition takes place because the system can actually exist in several phases, more than one phase, and that it, one of the phases in which it exists has become unstable and it finds it energetically more favorable to go to a more stable state. So we need to look at stability of states. We need to look at criteria of stability. And we are talking of equilibrium states and therefore looking at stability of equilibrium states. The example that we also considered once earlier was an analogy. An analogy that we also considered earlier was that of a mechanical system. <clears throat> um, mechanical stability. Um, consider the case of uh, a ball in a ball or ball marble in a ball a marble in a ball <clears throat> so what we have in mind is that there is this uh, ball <clears throat> characterized by a minimum and uh, we we we
place in it a marble and let marble acquire a state um, spontaneously without anything else influencing it. The principle of mechanic of minimum energy will work here. And uh, the marble will come and rest at the bottom over here. Um, on the other hand, if the bowl were inverted and we put a marble on top, this is a very unstable state. A little bit of disturbance and the, you may be able to balance it at the top but any bit of disturbance will make it go away from this state. So this state is most unstable um, and this state is stable. This is our common observation and you were right to actually derive some principles from this uh, common observation. One can also think of a situation where you have a uh, a container like this, shaped like this, and a uh, marble being placed over here. Then obviously this marble, if you leave it undisturbed, would happily stay over here. But if you give it sufficient amount of push in some manner, disturb it, it might cross over this um, barrier and then eventually it will come down and rest over here. So this is a stable state, this is an unstable state and this could be called, we could call it quasi-stable state or we could call it meta-stable state. <coughs> quasi-stable state or meta-stable state. And I think I also gave another example some time ago. Suppose you place, you have a flat table like this and um, you again place a marble, of course you can place a marble and marble will rest over here um, happily until a little bit of disturbance disturbs it and makes it change its place. The point is that on this surface, the marble has absolutely no preferred state to go to. All the states are equally preferred. So this is, uh, all the states are um, equally preferred. So we have therefore a mechanical picture from our common observation over here. The principle that works over here is principle of minimum energy which we articulate as uh, um, D2E being positive. Double derivative being positive. Well, um, you know, um, if you have a quantity A depending upon a quantity B in some manner then the single derivative dA by dt dB is a slope on this curve at a particular point. A slope at that particular point. And d2A by dB squared describes curvature. It describes curvature. And curvature means that, you know, you can have two different kinds of curvatures. When, when D2A by DB squared is uh, positive, 
Um, then you say that this is, I just have these uh, things over here, yeah, it's positive, then you call it a con, a is a convex function of B. This is, I just don't have to um, worry too much about this definition. I'm just using a terminology that is often used. And of course, you hear of this uh, convex lenses and concave lenses, and these, are these curvatures basically are given by these double differentials. So when d2a by db squared is positive, then a is supposed to be a convex function of b, and the shape is uh, a versus b such that it has a minimum at some point. So a convex function is uh, likely to have a uh, minimum at some point. On the other hand, if you have uh, d2a by db squared negative, then you have uh, uh, what is called, uh, let me quickly check this out. Uh, yeah, this is a, will be called a concave function and concave function will have a maximum. Concave function, so you will say that A is a concave function of B and if you plot it, uh, it will be more like this, which will have a maximum over here. So you have convex function here and you have concave function over here. All right. So D2, when I, when I said this, made this statement, I meant to say that this is a convex function and that it therefore supports a, it, it shows a minimum at some point. So principle of minimum energy means that D to E will have to be a convex function, will have to have a minimum somewhere. Or the principle, the other principle that we will use, and this is this principle translated into our nomenclature, our variables, would amount to saying that D to U is positive, right? because for energy we use internal energy function which is u. And a concave function we will say d2 and it happens that entropy is such a function that is a concave function of its variables and it has to be negative. So we are sort of now trying to are able to classify states and describe um, uh, the, the, the um, stability properties of states in terms of these functions and these criteria. Let me, let us first of all take, and now I'm going to uh, look at thermodynamic functions on the basis of this and we will determine we will find conditions under which we say a particular state is stable or not. So let us say U, internal energy is a function of S and V, all right? So D2 U being positive actually amounts to saying that you want to find out partial differential of u, double differential of u with respect to s at constant v. And you also want to find out partial differential, double differential of uh, u with respect to v at constant s. Okay, yeah. So when you're writing d square s is less than zero, that means it is uh, concave with respect to all variables? On variables that it depends upon, yes. Okay? Not all variables, no. And I will show you shortly uh, what I mean by that, okay? Uh, so 
So you have therefore D to U being positive amount, uh, amounting to these things and this being positive and this being positive would be the condition under which U will be a convex function of its variables. Now, d to u by ds squared is, uh, you know that du by ds at constant v. Now I'm going to do, I do these things again and again so that if you have any um, uh, worry about these, the mathematics, I take it to the du by ds at constant v happens to be t. All right? And therefore, d to u by ds squared at constant v will be equal to dt by ds at constant v, right? Which will be equal to t over cv, all right? And the condition that this must be positive for a, a state to be in a stable state of equilibrium this should be positive. Now, temperature is always positive, right? You don't have negative temperatures on the absolute scale. So you have, therefore, the condition amounts to saying that CV should be positive. And CV being positive actually, this says that if a system is in a state of stable equilibrium, then its heat capacity must be a positive quantity, positive definite quantity, okay? And this actually amounts to saying that dq delta q by delta t should be positive, which means that when you supply heat to it, its temperature must rise, all right? So the condition, which is obviously something that we always take for granted, is that this is actually the condition for the state to be a state of equilibrium. That you, when you supply heat to it, its temperature must rise. Or when you increase the temperature, its energy content or heat um, must fall. That whatever. Let, let, let me put it in the earlier form. When you supply heat to it, its temperature must rise. Okay, how about this? du by dv at constant s, you will recall, was equal to minus p, right? From our first expression, du equal to tds minus p dv. Okay. So that du by ds at constant uh, du by dv at constant s is minus p, which means that dt d2u by dv squared at constant s is minus dp by dv at constant s. <coughs> All right. And uh, this amounts, this is actually equal to, you know, kappa s, the heat, the, the, the compressibility, isothermal compressibility, is defined as minus 1 over V dV by dP at constant S. Because it is defined this way, therefore dP by dV is uh, actually 1 over, this is with a minus sign over here, 1 over V kappa S. All right? And V again is a positive quantity. You don't have negative volumes. So kappa S must be a positive quantity. So when you say that this should be a positive quantity for a state to be in a stable state of equilibrium, you mean the other response function kappa S has to be positive and this actually amounts to saying that system should be such that when you increase pressure on it, its volume must decrease, okay? Increasing pressure must decrease volume, increasing volume must decrease pressure. That should be the condition for uh, uh, that state of the system to be uh, 
stable. All right. So what about S as a function of U and V? We took U as a function of S and V. We can now take the other criterion, D to S being negative. We can take that. Now, um, uh, we would like to then assert that D to S by D U squared at constant V must be negative and d to s by d v squared at constant u must be negative. These are the conditions that should be satisfied by a system which is in a stable state of equilibrium. And you will notice, and I have actually done only one of them, uh, that d to s by d u squared at constant volume will be um, ds by du at constant volume happens to be 1 over t and therefore d um, um, of d by du of 1 over t at constant volume will come out to be minus 1 over t squared times dt by du at constant v and this will be equal to minus now dt du by dt at constant v we said was equal to cv so this is 1 over cv so minus 1 over t squared times cv all right uh, is it okay Huh? Can I explain? Okay. Um, this is correct, right? ds by dt. So we have this relationship. And from this relationship, ds equal to 1 over t times du minus p over t times dv. All right? So I want to find out ds by du. So I divide by du. I divide by du. I divide by du. And I hold V constant, so I hold V constant, I hold V constant, and I hold V constant. All right? And because I hold V constant, this is 0, and this is 1, so I get ds by du at constant V equal to 1 over t. You happy now? Okay? Now, this was therefore 1 over t, and I now say, double differential with, of, with respect to u at constant v. So double differential of this means now we, I differentiate again. And when I differentiate again, 1 over t is minus 1 over t squared times dt by dv, du at constant v. And that is what this is. All right? Now, big, and we say that this must be negative, which means that t squared cv must be positive. And t squared is positive anyway, so cv must be positive. So this again demands that cv must be positive. And we have already seen that cv being positive amounts to saying that when you supply heat to the system, the temperature must rise. When you take heat away from the system, the temperature must fall. Are you asking something? No. OK. OK. <clears throat> So this is, okay, and, and, and work it out. Simple statement from all of this is that all response functions must be positive. Whichever criterion you use, whether this or this, for a um, for a for an equilibrium state to be stable. 
if it is not stable, then system will not stay in it. System will have choices. It will not stay in a stable, an unstable state. It will move to a stable alternative. And that is what we mean by phase transitions. Okay, simple logic. This one. Oh, the, he is asking, um, where has this condition come from? And this condition is actually a representation of this condition. And here I said, S is a function of U and V. So D2S corresponds to this or this. Okay, could be a function of some other variables too. Whatever you take. And therefore I put a, work it out and I will put some dots over here that you can take some other dependence and check this out. And eventually what you will notice is that the condition will be that the response functions must be positive. In fact, this is sort of going in a circle. We had already defined response functions in such a manner that they were to be always positive. But when we defined it that way, we already had equilibrium, stable equilibrium states in our minds. Therefore, we defined them that way. And now sort of we are going in a circle and coming back and saying that for a state to be stable, the condition is, and we are actually saying that this is the only condition that we require. Nothing else. This is the only condition. Yeah. This one? I'm sorry? Oh, I was wrong. Yes, you are right. 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 Any other comment? Question? Okay. Is what? P over T. Uh, yes, yes. And then you will work it out further. Yes. Okay. Okay, so he is informing us that ds over dv at constant u is coming out to be P over T. And therefore, when you take a further derivative of that with respect to V, then it will be a little more complicated. And that is why I said work it out. All right. <laughs> you should be able to do, do the more difficult job. I will do the easy job. Okay? Good. All right. Now, I would actually now describe a basic principle. And the basic principle follows again from very simple observation. And I bring you back to this particular mechanical model because we uh, know it so well that we can sort of understand this and then from there on we can try and uh, understand how the principle comes about. Now take this state, or oh, maybe start with this. Disturb it slightly and the marble will uh, slide off to either that side or this side. This is a very, very unstable state. There is nothing that can stop it from falling down unless we sort of glue it up on top. Consider this instead. Uh, dis disturb this marble. It will change its position. Will go that way or this way. But then as soon as it goes that way, its potential energy, mechanical potential energy, rises. And therefore, the principle of minimum energy would demand that it comes back to the original state. And therefore, what will happen, as you can see, if I disturb it and take it here, it will come back, overshoot, will go back, and then so on. It will oscillate a number of times and eventually stop over here. 
All right, this is the common observation. What has happened here is that as soon as you disturb the system, a process was generated which, which wanted the system to come back to its original state. Okay? Let me repeat. As soon as we disturb this from this state of equilibrium, as soon as we took it away from this state of equilibrium, a process was generated which tended to bring the system back to the original state. So, this is, a, we therefore have a principle at hand. A stable state is one um, in which a disturbance perturbation if you like generates processes that tend to bring the system okay tend to restore the original state all right this is the basic principle that if the system the state of the system is stable, you disturb it, it will create processes which will tend to restore the system, try to keep away the disturbance and bring it back. All right? So our body is a very stable organism. So if uh, a speck of dust falls into our eye, eye starts to bring out water. Water comes out. In order to throw out that external body and to restore the, body, the eye to its original, original shape, or or out outside a pollen particle gets into our nostril and we start to sneeze because we want to throw it out. So all of these actions, which are involuntary actions, are actually uh, they describe a, a very stable state of our uh, organic being that this is a very stable state and any disturbance will try to create processes will, that will tend to restore uh, the original state of the system. All right? So let, me, let us take the, a thermodynamic example. Um, <clears throat> if suppose you have a piston and uh, in a cylinder and there is this pressure P and volume V and this pressure is the same as this pressure outside and you pull it out as soon as you pull it out such processes are generated which will try and restore the system in as, as long as this pressure is the same as this pressure or this pressure is the same as this pressure on this side there is an equilibrium between the two sides. As soon as you pull it out to increase the volume over here, oops! Why don't people remind me that I... Uh, uh, I get caught nearly every day. Why eh? do Okay. So we have therefore, as, as long as the pressures are equal, um, they, they are in equilibrium. They are, this is a stable state of equilibrium with respect to this. As soon as you pull it out, the volume increases, the pressure decreases. And as soon as there is a pressure differential uh, from, with, with outside, um, the pressure becomes here P prime and P prime is less than P 
So a pressure difference is created, and that pressure difference will try and push it back inside. So as soon as you pull it out, this pressure difference is created, which pushes it back into the original state. And therefore, uh, such, such processes are generated which restore the system to the original state. That is the sign of a system being in a stable state of equilibrium. There is another part to it. It can actually be an indirect uh, processes also. And these indirect processes, one simple example of these indirect processes is uh, um, the same example, except that I have a freely moving piston over here too. And this is the uh, uh, so a piston, yeah, this is the piston that I can pull out. Initially, they are all at the same pressure. So they are all <coughs> in equilibrium with each other. <coughs> and then I pull this out, and I create a pressure over here, which is uh, P1, P prime, or P1, which is less than P. As soon as this pressure P1 is less than P, then it is also less than this pressure. And therefore, this wall, movable wall, will also move in order to equate the pressure. So all three of them, this and this, all, all two of these uh, walls will move in order to equate pressures and bring the system back into back to state of equilibrium with each other when all the pressures are equal. So this is an indirect process. And you can actually think of a series of such walls. And as soon as you disturb at one end, all of them would move so that disturbance in pressure is again completely equalized and all of them have equal uh, pressures. All right? This principle, yeah? Which one? The first one or the second one? Indirect one. So um, when I take this out, the pressure inside is less than P, becomes less than P because I take it out. This volume increases, and therefore this pressure becomes less than 1. So it has a pressure P1, which is less than P. But this P1 is also smaller than this P. And that pressure differential is, a pressure differential is created over here also. And therefore, this wall will also move. So not only that this, uh, the restoration process will involve this piston going back, but also this coming in to take its place also. And eventually, all of them being equal, yeah. How does that qualify? As an indirect process. This qualifies as an indirect process because we initially did not disturb this wall at all. We only, this is, this wall is being moved in an indirect way. We only moved this piston and because of pressure differentials, this wall moved. Okay? So that is why, that is, that is why it is called indirect and as I said, you can have actually two or three or four walls and all of them will move and there will be that uh, kind of indirect process. So will they restore the same pressure being equal? I'm sorry? Will they will restore, you see, okay, will they restore the same pressure P? Suppose you pull it out and then leave it, let it go back. All of them will go back to pressure P. Suppose you pull it out and now hold it then these two will define a new pressure between them. All right? Because you are holding it, now it doesn't really matter if the pressure inside is equal to this pressure or not because you're holding it. Okay? But if you are not holding it, then again all the pressures will be equal. Uh, if the pressures go back to the original, then the volume is again be restored to the original value. Okay? The question was, will the volume also become the same, original volume? 
Yes, if the pressures go back to the original values, volume will also, volume of each part will also go back to the original volume. But if, suppose you take it out and hold it, then of course the volumes will change because the pressures will change. Sorry? Will the ratio remain the same? Will the ratio remain the same? Ratio of volumes. Uh, ratio of volumes. Now that, that uh, is completely governed by the equation of state of the system. All right? So um, they, 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 they will be, you know, or the gas laws, PV is equal to constant. So ratio will, ratios will remain the same if the gas laws are being followed. Any more questions? No. Okay. So here we are. We, this, this has a fancy name in books uh, called La Chatelier Principle. And this one is, uh, has the additional name of Mr. Brown, Chatelier Brown principle. All right. Sir, this is a question. Sir, this is a question. All right. So his question is, um, suppose we pull it out and hold it. So this pressure becomes P1. Uh, will that pressure P1 be the same in this also? No. The both of them will actually evolve into a, into a pressure which will be common to both, which will be equal in both cases, right? So the pressure will have to be equalized, and therefore if there is only one over here, P1, and this is pressure P, so the pressure will be P1 plus P over 2, the median pressure. So the n number of walls is like that, so P1 plus P over 2 Either that, or, or go back to think in terms of uh, PV equal to constant, all right? So PV equal to constant, pressure and volume, P1, V1 equal to P2, V2 equal to P3, V3, and those will, uh, th those, that will determine what the final value of P in each case will be. Okay, uh, now this is how stability is defined. Let me also take up uh, the question of stability and try and see the uh, question of uh, um, a few other interesting points that come up. You may recall that you wrote entropy as minus partial differential of F with respect to T at constant volume. All right? We recall this. Everything follows from that equa this equation. du equal to Tds minus Pdv. You have du equal to Tds minus Pdv. And you say F, I'm just for taking you back to the, you know, elementary calculations. You, if you want to take F, the Helmholtz free energy, as a Legend transform of U with respect to interchanging T and S, then DF is equal to minus S DT minus P DV. And therefore, from here, minus S is minus partial, di partial differential of F with respect to T at constant volume. This is what I wrote. Okay? <coughs> Recall that this is uh, an expression and therefore <coughs> um, heat capacity Cv will be equal to T times dS by dt at constant volume <coughs> and therefore this is equal to <coughs> minus 
t times d2f by dt squared at constant volume and um, if you want we have already said that heat capacity ought to be positive for a stable state of equilibrium so for a stable state of equilibrium we now see that d2f by dt squared must be negative. If Cv has to be positive, then this quantity has to be negative. In other words, if the state is, in a, is, is a stable equilibrium state, then for that state, F has to be, we said, a concave function. So F a concave function of T. So F as a function of T will have a maximum. So F as a function of T will have a maximum. Will be a concave function. Right? Because uh, this is what we said uh, here. Somewhere here. Right? What did we say? We said these things over here. So if double differential is negative, there is a concave function, and this is a concave function which has a maximum. We can look at uh, similar things. For example, uh, I could uh, look at uh, S also is given as minus dg by dt at constant p. Okay, and this follows because S is a uh, G is a Legendre transform of F with respect to interchanging the role of P and V. So dG is equal to minus S dT plus V dP, and therefore minus S is equal to dG by dT at constant P. This is what I wrote over there. Okay, and hence Cp is equal to Cp is equal to minus T times D2G by DT squared at constant P. And therefore Cp because Cp heat capacity must be a positive quantity in a stable equilibrium state, therefore G also has to be, as a function of T, has to be a concave function uh, allowing for a maximum, as a function of T. Ah. I'm sorry? What did I say? Yeah. As a function of which variable? This is, this is why I am describing this whole thing. I'm, this, is, this is a good question. He asked, um, shouldn't energy be a function that has a minimum for a stable state? Shouldn't that always be true? This is the question. And I'm actually doing all of this exercise to show that that is not always the case. Here we have these two examples. These are energy functions, F and G. And in these energy functions, as a function of temperature, they are not. Because uh, we would like heat capacities to be positive definite. The principle is heat capacity response. The principle has been stated in terms of response functions. All right? Not in terms of uh, these energy functions. And then, now what I'm trying to show is that these energy functions can act actually not necessarily be convex. They can be concave. They will be 
uh, convex with respect to some other variable. But they are, in this, these particular cases, concave. All right, this is a good point, because that is uh, what you observe in this particular case. All right, and I can now take up, uh, for example, I took up this, these two cases. I can take uh, uh, I have actually a nice table over here, which you can um, check out. Um, and this table will actually be something that you can check out yourself, all right? By just ensuring that response functions are positive definite. And then you look at these things, and the table says that G, uh, versus, okay, uh, what did I um, write over here? Uh, mm, what I am saying over here is um, something uh, different. Huh? Uh, hold on a sec. This is negative, yes. So this paper is supplies wrong information. Let me um, let me show these things. Okay, what I will leave you with is the following exercise. Follow this principle and follow these uh, statements over here. Find the uh, G versus P. G versus T, F versus V, F versus uh, T, U versus S, U versus T, not T but V, and 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 H versus P and H versus S. Find the curvature properties of these functions. Okay? Uh, do this exercise, you will convince yourself that uh, some of them are concave functions, others are convex functions with respect to these variables. When you demand that response functions be positive. Okay. <clears throat> So now, um, how do we view now how do we view transition from one state to Another. Um, how do you transitions? How, on the basis of a minimum in the energy function and so on. Suppose we look at um, <clears throat> minimum of uh, Gibbs free energy. Gibbs free energy will be minimum with respect to some parameters, so we can take that. And uh, we can visualize um, uh, if there is uh, only one minimum, minimum available. Uh, this is all schematic, okay? There is no physics, no system. It's only schematic. It's only meant to comprehend um, uh, the, the whole process. So this is... Uh, if there is only one minimum, system has only one state to go to. All right? If the system has a choice of um, transition from one, choice of two states, then G ought to be something like this. We'll have to have two minima. One minimum corresponding to one state, the other minimum corresponding to 
the other step. Okay? And um, you can have a situation where a system can be made into jump over the barrier and go into the other state. It is possible. System could be, you know, turn to go from state one to state two um, by jumping over the barrier. Um, the minima could be such that they could be uh, of different depths, you know, less amount of energy. They, this is a very deep minimum and therefore a very stable state in the sense that the amount of disturbance it would need to get out of this state would be very large. Whereas this is a shallow minimum and the amount of disturbance it needs to get out of this state is very small. So it is easier for it to jump over and get into the other state. And this, for this it will be difficult to get from here to here. <coughs> All right. So we visualize transition from one state to the other in terms of jumping uh, of the system from one minimum to the other minimum. All right. Um, in some cases, the system may be able to jump on its own. In the other cases, the system may not be able to jump on its own. Let me also then look at um, one way of uh, uh, this, this, this thing can happen. Suppose system exists in two states. All right. Suppose the system, a system exists in two states, and therefore it has two minima. And these two minima are such that uh, initially the minima are in favor of I would call it state one and state two. Initially, the minima are in the favor of state two. State 2 is a more stable state. And then finally, it, um, the state 1 is more favorable and uh, state 2 is less favorable. Okay? And there is a transition that takes place from this situation to this situation. And that transition could amount to saying that actually both of them are equally likely at the point of transition. So it sort of starts from here when state one is, uh, less, is, 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 is less stable than state two. So the system is in state two. It ends up in a situation where state one is more stable and system finds state itself in state two. And in doing that, it passes through a situation where both of them have the same value of the Gibbs free energy. And it goes from this, this st uh, situation to this situation in order to get into this situation. So this must be the intermediate situation where the transition actually occurs. This is the point where the transition occurs, where the system goes from this situation into this situation. All right. And this is what we, and if you, if you like, we can also <coughs> look at, uh, uh, I, 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 what did I plot over here? Let me be a little more specific. Suppose I said this is volume V, and this is uh, gift for energy G on this side. And I think I, what I'm trying to say is that it has these values of volume V1 and V2, I don't have all of them at the same point, but you know, V1 and V2. So it actually has uh, uh, values V1 and V2. Um, so what happens? Actually, it starts from a situation where it is in a state where volume is large, and it ends up in a situation where volume is small. And this volume could be the total volume available, of course, in, a, in an experiment. Uh, in a lab, you will have a fixed volume. So what we have over here is perhaps molar volume. 
volume allowed per mole. So here you have volume, molar volume V2 and here you have molar volume V1. And you therefore make a transition from a higher molar volume to a lower molar volume. And that is precisely what happens in the case of a transition from a gaseous state into a liquid state. Right? In a, this is more like a gaseous situation could correspond to a gaseous state where the system volume, molar volume is large and this could correspond to a liquid state or a condensed state where the molar volume is small. So this transition has taken place and at a particular, and this suppose has taken place, this was the temperature T1 and this was the temperature T2 and this is temperature T3 and the transition has taken place as at temperature T2. Okay? If you like we can actually have a look at it in the following form. We can say that there is this temperature T and there is this G. <coughs> All right? Is everybody following? Questions? Phase and state. All right. The word state um, of a large thermodynamic system is, uh, is used normally um, for the word phase. Phase in the sense that a system like H2O can exist in different phases. But we can also say that each of these phases can exist in several phases, several states. Water can, stay, can exist in several different states. Uh, it can be at temperature, you know, if it is water, it can be temperature 20 or 30 or 40 or 50. Each one of these will be a different state for, of, the, of the system of water, liquid water. All right? But H2O exists in phase vapor, liquid, and uh, solid. All right? So if I were to actually schematically calculate G and um, uh, for these states, this state and this state, and uh, as a function of temperature and plot, I will suppose as a function of temperature I calculate the value of G and plot these would actually something like correspond something like this. There will be um, values which will correspond to this. Now what have I plotted over here? I have plotted uh, this for uh, uh, state um, uh, as a function of temperature. Temperature is varying and I am plotting G as a function of temperature. and. Uh, these two different values at the same temperature correspond to two different minima that exist and two, uh, two different values of G at the same temperature correspond to two different minima and this is the point at which both the minima are equal. Okay, So I am plotting G minimum as a function of T. And I notice that uh, there is a crossover from this slope to this slope. Uh, this corresponds to in my uh, uh, after at higher temperatures I think what I'm trying to take over here is that this is uh, if you go up here you're going towards higher temperatures. Why do I say that? Because at higher temperature, state with higher molar volume becomes more stable and that is what we should expect. System will evaporate and gaseous phase will have a larger molar volume and therefore uh, T1 should be higher than T2 should be higher than T3. T1 should be higher than T2 should be higher than T3. So 
at larger uh, value, this is becomes more stable. So this is state two, and this is state one. So the one and two that I have defined over here are these curves. All right. Let me let me let me state all of this again. Okay. In case any there's any confusion. What I'm what I'm doing over here is I am taking these values, minimum values of G for each of these temperatures and plotting them. Alright? Both these minima and I get uh, one curve temperature dependence of G minimum for this uh, minimum and another curve for this minimum. And at a given temperature, I should have two minima, and I have therefore two uh, two points for a given temperature. All right. And at temperature T two that I have described over here, the two minima have the same value. And and I said that T's are increasing this way, and as you increase this way this becomes the state of uh, lower G than this state and therefore this becomes the state 2, the minimum 2 and this becomes the minimum 1, curve for minimum 1. Alright? So this is the curve for minimum 1 and this is the curve for minimum 2 and they cross over here. <laughs> and now comes the point when I am in a position to, there is no color chalk over here, but oh, there is one, only yellow. There is a red one over here too. Um, I can now identify and say that if G has to be a minimum, then this and this are the states. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, Pardon me. And I said that the system state will be this and then this. And there is a transition at this particular point which we said T2, but we should say this is the transition temperature we will write. TT or TTR as the transition temperature at which the system has gone from this state to this state. This is what I described over here. It goes from this state to this state. This is how we view phase transitions um, for this case. In fact, one can, one can think of a more complicated situation like the situation of H2O where it can exist in the state, not just two states, um, vapor and liquid, but also solid, so that you will have uh, um, um, three different kinds of curves like this. These are again G minimum as a function of T, and and because of this, you say that actually system initially exists in this phase and then this phase and then a phase like this. So this is the liquid phase and this is the, oh, I'm sorry, this is the gaseous phase. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. So this is the actually the gaseous phase and the liquid phase and solid phase. It undergoes phase transitions in this manner. But this is a slightly misleading picture. We will actually, this is, this is only trying to understand how things go, but we will um, get to see the phase transitions, uh, question of phase transitions a little more detail. Um, and I haven't yet 
I gave you an overview of the physics of phase transitions in the, in the last lecture, where I drew a number of different curves. And I haven't yet um, come to them yet. So you will have to wait until the next lecture to understand. But one important thing <coughs> to understand. There are no phase transitions in an ideal gas. Ideal gases exist in only one phase. They do not exist in um, more phases, more than one phase. There are no phase transitions in an ideal gas. So phase transitions exist only only in interacting systems when systems have interparticle interactions between them. For some reason, switch off interparticle interactions in a system, if you could, we cannot, but if you could, switch off interactions between particles in a system, the system will exist in only one phase. There will not be any um, multiplicity of phases that system can exist in. All right? And that, therefore, is very important. Interacting systems. It tells you that <coughs> um, existence of phases multiple phases is a result of system going from a less ordered state to a more ordered state. Uh, the phases are different in terms of the order that they represent. And um, phase transitions are transitions from a less ordered state to a more ordered state or from a more ordered state into a less ordered state. So there is a change of order inside the system as system changes its phases. So phases are represented by order in them. And <clears throat> phases uh, characterized by order. By degree of order. Inside the system. And Degree of order comes about because of interactions between particles. If particles are non-interacting, you cannot expect them to come to an order. So there will have to be a communication between particles for them to be able to get into a state of order. If they cannot communicate with each other, they just cannot get into a state of order. They will have to sort of um, be able to communicate with each other, to be able to see what the other is doing, so that the action of one particle is in accordance with the action of the other particle. And in that order, that coordinated, cooperative manner, an order is created. So the face, the, the, the order that is created of whatever kind, whether it is only forming a liquid from a vapor, is essentially a result of communication between particles, a result of adjusting to each other in a newer state. All right? So we will discuss other things later on in the next lecture.
आएगा